Bruchem Aboim, welcome to our home. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, this week's my thought is the greatest miracle in the desert, part one. So in this week's my thought, I would like to examine what I feel was the greatest miracle that occurred daily during the 40 years that the children of Israel journeyed in the desert, the mud. A miracle that, will, that we actually still commemorate each and every week of the year as we dine at our Shabbat tables. This is in addition to all the holidays when we begin our meals with what we call Lechem Mishnah, again, two loaves of bread that we place on our tables. Now, since this, my thought is about the mun, and one of the miracles associated with the mun was that every day they collected the same amount of mun, and it made no difference how much or little they collected, it was always the same amount in Omer. But on Friday, Though they collected the exact same amount as they did every day, it miraculously became a double portion in the honor of the Shabbat. So based on this fact, I thought that it would be only apropos to give this lecture in two parts to commemorate, again, the Lech mission of the double portion. So let me begin my lecture here with a question. I wonder if you were given a choice of living off the mun from heaven or the national food from earth, which would you choose? You know, we are told by our sages that there were three gifts that were given to the nation while they traveled in the desert. These three gifts were the well of Miriam, the clouds of glory, and the mun. They were all gifts given by God Almighty to the Israelite nation. He did so in the merit of the three shepherds that led the nation on their journey throughout the wilderness. They were Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe. The well of Miriam was much more than just a well or a rock. It produced a miraculous sea of water that followed the nation on their journeys throughout the 40 years in the desert. One could only imagine how much water was needed for 3 million people and their animals. Actually, how many animals could there have been? So I was thinking that the Talmud in Brachot discusses the question as to why it was only the firstborn of a donkey is sanctified and must therefore be redeemed with a sheep, which is not the case with any other non-kosher animal. Well, the Talmud answers that God rewarded the donkeys since they aided the Jewish people when they left Egypt. He continues and states, you would not have found a single one of the Jewish people who did not have with him 90 Libyan donkeys. So based on the Talmud, if we were to multiply 90 times 600,000, the number of men between the ages of 20 and 60 of years of age. It equals 54 million. That's a lot of donkeys, and they would need a great deal of water. Of course, we know there was also other animals as well. So the miracle of the well of Miriam was truly spectacular. To get a greater perspective to the scope of, the, of this miracle, there's another medrash that states that when the nation camped, the prince of each tribe would take his staff and make a mark in the sand. Immediately, the water would begin to flow. Once the water stopped flowing, it would take a boat to travel from one tribe to another. This continuous source of water was supplied to the nation in the merit of Miriam. She was one of the Jewish midwives in Egypt who refused to follow Paro's command to kill all male babies as they exited their mother's womb. As a reward for her action, she was credited with the well of Miriam, a, a perpetual, miraculous sea of fresh water, which gave life to the living. In addition, it also allowed married couples to observe the Torah laws of family purity, mikvah. So just as the well of Miriam allowed for new life to be brought into this world, so too did it allow the whole Jewish nation to ritually purify themselves when they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. This included men, women, and children. They all became Jewish by immersing themselves in the well of Miriam. Now, going to the mikveh is still one of the rituals necessary in accepting Judaism, even today. It was her gift that allowed the whole nation to become Jewish. There was an additional benefit the water produced. Wherever the nation camped, the desert was transformed into a lush and beautiful garden, a taste of the world to come. The nation was blessed with water, earth, and a sealed environment, a recipe for nature to blossom. 
creating a visual and aromatic delight. The mun fell daily for the people, but it was totally consumed. So the question had to be, so what did all the animals eat? I believe that the answer may connect to the words that we recite in the second paragraph of the Shema Yisrael, where it states, which means, and I, God Almighty, will give grass in your field for your animals. They were fed directly by the hand of God, the grass that the desert produced. This also would have given the people a natural way to feed all of their animals with very little effort on their part. You know, the Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory, surrounded the nation in the merit of Aaron, the high priest. His character trace was Shalom, peace. Hillel stated in Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers, that Aaron was an Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom, meaning he was a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. His gift, the clouds of glory, embraced the whole nation equally, showing no preference to rank or status. There was a period of time immediately after the making of the golden calf where God removed the clouds temporarily. Since the clouds were a gift that were given in, the, in Aaron's merit, then it was Aaron who made the golden calf. God decided that it was only proper that his gift should be removed. But then immediately as the nation began to construct the tabernacle, the house of God, the clouds of glory returned. The clouds remained with the nation until the death of Aaron in the 40th year of their journey in the desert. Both of these gifts, the water and the clouds, came from some natural physical source. After all, water is a natural element, and so are clouds. But the mun, the spiritual food that fell from heaven daily, that was a totally spiritual creation. Moshe referred to it as lechem min hashemayim, food from heaven, since its constitution was unlike any natural food. For one, it was not a product of the earth like most produce. Also, the amount that was allotted to each individual was constant, regardless of how much or how little they collected. It was always the same, one omer per person. And Mechilta states that eating the, that amount of food daily is healthy and is a blessing. Eating less would be detrimental to one's health, and eating more would be considered gluttonous. The blessing that we recite in the second paragraph of the Shema reads, the achalta visavata and you will eat, and you will be sated. This conforms to what the Rambam teaches us. Take all things in moderation, eating with your stomach and not with your eyes. You know, the Rambam also said that most of the diseases in the world can trace their origin back to obesity. There's a story told of Alexander the Great, whose army had marched on a city that was inhabited only by women. The women sent a message suggesting to him that attacking them would have little value. If it happened that they, the women, should win, it would be very embarrassing to him. And if he were to win, whom did he be? Women? So Alexander decided to follow their suggestion, and he did not attack the city. As a gift for his benevolence, they revealed to him the location of Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. The women instructed him to follow a certain stream, and they said that it would lead him to the garden. And so he followed the stream, and it did lead him to the Garden of Eden. Standing guard at the entrance of the garden was an angel with a fiery sword. Alexander asked to be admitted, but the angel refused. So Alexander said to the angel, but, but I'm Alexander the Great. I cannot leave here empty-handed. Well, the angel replied, if so, I will give you a gift. He then handed Alexander a small, round object. Alexander looked down at the object in his hand and he said, That's all? Uh, the angel then said to him, When you return to your palace, take this small, round object and place it on a scale. And then bring all of your silver and gold stored in your royal treasury and place it on the other side of the scale. And you will see that it will weigh more than all of the riches that are in your treasury. And so Alexander took the small round ball and brought it back to his palace. He then placed it on a scale and began placing more and more gold and silver on the opposite side of the scale. And to his amazement, the side with the ball didn't budge at all. 
He was curious as to what the ball could be. He posed the question to all of the wise men of Greece, but none to, could explain the phenomena that they were witnessing. He then took his question to the Jewish sages. They told him that the ball was a human eye. Well, Alexander didn't accept their answer. He said that was impossible. So they instructed him to take all of his riches off the scale and replace it with a little container of earth. And so he did. And sure enough, that little container of earth was heavier than the little round ball. So Alexander asked the sages, what, what did all this mean? And they told him that as long as a man is alive, his eye cannot be sated with wealth. But once he dies and earth is placed on his eye, huh, his quest is over. I believe that as Jews, many of us still view our food as did our ancestors in the wilderness. You know, the mun, though it may have satisfied the needs of the stomach somehow, it just didn't seem to satisfy the hunger of the eye. The residual effect of the man has become part of our collective Jewish DNA. We as Jews eat with our eyes and not with our stomachs. We often refer to Judaism as a religion of the stomach. It would seem that almost all our holidays, including the Shabbat, are connected with food. Rebbe Leo Lopen states, that in verse 16, God commanded that they should gather the mun, each lefi ochlo, each man according to their needs. Then in verse 21, he repeats again that they should collect the mun, each kifi ochlo, each person again according to their needs. So it would seem that both of these statements are identical, but they are not. The first statement was made lefi with the lamid meaning that initially God gave each person the exact amount of mun that they would need to sustain their bodies for one day. Lefi, according to. However, those that were lacking in faith cut back on what they ate, and they saved some of their mun for the next day. This, of course, rotted and became wormy. Then from that day on, when they collected, it became kifi, with a cuff. What they had actually eaten, no longer lefi, what God had intended for them. That then became the exact amount of mun that they received every day from that day on, regardless of how much they gathered. The Torah quoting the Ramban states that nothing about the mun was natural. We see that in the fact that God purposely changed the order of decomposition and then stench. This occurred so that they would not be alerted to the rotting of the mun before Moshe would be able to rebuke them. Had it stunk first, they would have automatically removed it from their tents at night. This then was the reason that God changed the national order to alert us to this fact. Now the Auschwitz states that the amount of money that they gathered was the same for everyone, even small children. Since the food was of a spiritual nature, on a soul level, it's interesting, we are all the same regardless of age or size. Bodies are measured quantitatively whereas souls are mentioned qualitatively. So even small babies receive the same amount as did the adults. In addition, though they ingested the money into their bodies, there was never a need for a person to relieve themselves. This, there was no body waste product associated with the money. It was all used up to fuel both their bodies and their souls. It was in essence a perfect food. Though Rashi tells us the people were a bit concerned since it wasn't natural, they felt that somehow down the road it might decay in their bodies and harm them. And the Kleokar also states that the miracle associated with the man was that anything that was left over for the next day would become wormy and rot. However, there was an additional miracle that, occur that occurred every week with the man. Every day of the week, they would gather their man and it would always be the same amount, an omer. However, on Friday, even though they gathered the exact same amount as they had collected every day, miraculously, they found a double portion of mun was found for each person. The people were warned that they had that and they had witnessed that the mun could not be kept overnight without decomposing. However, the double portion they collected on Friday did not decompose since the second day was the Shabbat. 
When the moon fell on the camp, it would nestle on a bed of dew and also be covered with dew. This kept their moon clean and fresh. We commemorate this miracle every week in our homes by placing two of our Shabbat chalot on our table and then laying a covering over them. This is also why we still observe the custom even today that on the Shabbat and on the holidays we place two loaves of bread on our dining room table. This is referred to as lechem mishneh, a double portion of bread. The Hebrew word mishneh can also be broken up into two words, mem shona, for the 40 years. So lechem mishneh can also be read as lechem, the bread, which our ancestors ate, mem shona, for 40 years in the desert. All of this alludes to a person's life and their pursuit of material possessions and money. In the end, all the wealth and material possessions that a person amasses in this world will be left over for others. The only exception will be for that which we leave over for the Shabbat, alluding to our Torah and mitzvot. They will survive, and they will not be infested with worms. That then will be the food that will sustain us into the paradise of the next world, which is totally Shabbat. The portion of Bishalach began begins with Ha'am, the lowest of the people, complaining to Moshe and Aaron that they had no food. Ramosha Feinstein states that if the nation had not complained about the lack of food, then the miracle of the Mun would not have been necessary. They would experience an even greater miracle. They would not have had the need for food at all. They would have survived just like Moshe when he remained on the mountain on three separate occasions, each for a period of 40 days and 40 nights. While he was there in God's presence, he neither ate nor did he drink. Now we witness this possibility expressed in their clothing. Nowhere, nowhere in the Torah is written in the story of their travels in the desert that they complained about their clothing. That being the case, the results were that their clothing was blessed miraculously. No article of clothing that they wore on their bodies ever became worn or withered for the whole 40 years they traveled in the desert. Had they not complained about a lack of food, well, the same scenario would have miraculously occurred. They would have existed without the necessity for them to eat or drink. They would have survived much like Moses, Moshe on the mountain, as angels in heaven. Rabbi Hanok Alexander states, that each individual draws down his sustenance from the place where he is. That is the root of his actions. At the time that the children of Israel left Egypt, they were a holy nation on their way to receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. That being the case, their thoughts and their actions rested in heaven. Through that, they merited that they were fed lechem min hashemayim, food from heaven. In chapter 16, verse 4, it states that he, God Almighty, would make it rain bread from heaven. The Kliyakar says that the mom was given to the nation as a test. You know, food creates two barriers to our learning Torah. First, internally. Because of its physical nature, it blocks the mind and makes the body lazy. This was the reason why Moshe, during his visit on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, did not eat nor did he drink. Second, externally, the desire for physical pleasures and the vanities of life. That is in addition to the difficulty involved in making a living. You know, the Hebrew word for war is milchama. If you remove the three middle letters in the word milchama, they spell out the Hebrew word lechem, bread. Many times it can be a battle for a person to earn a living. So both these challenges at times create obstacles that take away from a person's strength and their desire to learn Torah. So God Almighty removed both of these obstacles with the gift of the man. He gave them the spiritual food of angels, which would be totally absorbed into their bodies. It fell every day without any necessity for work. All they had to do was bend down and pick it up. In addition, it tasted like anything they desired. And this was their test. Now that they had no distractions, would they study Torah or would they waste their time? The Talmud states 
that the two most difficult things that one can do is be in life is rich or poor. The common denominator is time. What do you do with time? Time is a double-edged sword. It can make you or it can break you. You know, I think that I'd like to stop here and with God's help finish this, my thought, next week. Stay tuned. <laughs> you might find it very eye-opening. Let us all hope to usher in the coming of Caesar Cana with that quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. Again, God should bless you only with good, happiness, health, and success. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.